Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Emily Raymond from the Department of History. I'm a professor in the Department and Director of Graduate Studies. Also joining us is Annie Newton, who graduated in 2018. And she wrote her thesis on the Donna Reed show. And that's why we're here to reunite. So thank you very much to Caitlin Hanbury from the Development Office for inviting us to do this. Um, the title of our, our webinar today is, sorry, I have sirens in the background. I live next to a fire station. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the title of the webinar is What Would Donna Reed Do from the Dawn of Television to a, the Global Pandemic that We're In? And so Annie's going to be talking to us about you know, writing her thesis, her findings, and then sort of where, uh, where she thinks we are today when it comes to mothers on television. Um, so thank you again for joining us, and we'll get started. So Annie, it's so great to reunite with you. <laughs> yes, I know. I was so, I'm so honored to have been asked to participate. And it was so fun to, you know, I obviously have not looked at this in several years. So it was so fun to kind of come back to Donna Reed and, and come back to kind of what we, we put together. So um, I'm excited to, to be here and be reunited. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did such a great job. And this thesis has been downloaded like almost 5,000 times. So, I mean, I think that really demonstrates how great your work is and also how relevant the work is. People are, are still interested in Donna Reed and she died in the 1980s. So yeah. pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about Donna Reed as Donna Reed, the actress, um, how she came to do the Donna Reed show in 1958. Yeah, so Donna Reed was born in Iowa um, in 1921, and she uh, moved to California when she, I think, was about 18, um, and lived with an aunt in California, and was discovered by MGM in, in 1941. She signed a contract with MGM in 1941, and we all know her from It's a Wonderful Life, um, which was filmed in 1946, um, and she kind of thought, you know, the It's a Wonderful Life doesn't really pick up a lot of steam until the 70s. Um, so at the time, you know, we all think, oh, that must have been her smashing hit, and it, it wasn't. Um, but she goes on to do From Here to Eternity in um, 1953, and she wins an Oscar for Best Supporting Actress, um, and she plays a prostitute named Alma. Um, and she, she really thought when she won the Oscar, she thought that was going to be her breakout role. Um, she thought that was going to be the role that kind of got her more kind of meaty work um, and that she was going to kind of pick up more stuff and she didn't. Um, you know, I don't know, you know, those of you who maybe aren't familiar with the way that kind of these studios used to work, but when you signed with a studio, you, you typically sign for a certain amount of movies and they would use you for all sort, they would crank these movies out very, very fast. Um, and so she does, she's got a lot of, of movies that she's starred in, but stuff we probably haven't heard of besides It's a Wonderful Life um, and From Here to Eternity. And she kept getting the same roles and was disappointed. She felt like she was kind of pigeonholed into this, what she called a, a goody, she called them goody, goody girl roles. Um, and she didn't like it. And she also saw, I think she was getting older and she realized that, you know, older actresses kind of get, and same today, they get kind of written out and pushed out of Hollywood. Um, and so she decides she, she wants to move into television. That's where the money is at the time. Um, and so her and her husband, Tony Owen, they form their own production company called Todon. Um, and they start looking into television shows. Um, and that's where she decides, okay, I'm going to move over to television. And she's trying to figure out kind of what she wants to do. Um, and they decide they're going to do a family show kind of around Donna. And that's how the Donna Reed show gets started. Um, and it's kind of amazing. I mean, she's, she's a producer. Um, she owns her own production company with her husband and she's not credited. So if you look at, if you watch the show, the, the credits that come up, it's just Tony as the producer and she was a producer with him. I mean, if you read interviews and, and look at stuff from um, people who were on set with her, she you know had full control over the script. She often kind of directed this narrative of, of the show. She knew exactly what she wanted. Um, the show to do and talk about. Um, so she had a lot of control. And I think it's kind of amazing that we don't talk about that. You know, we talk about Lucy 
um, who owned her own production company as well. Um, but those were the only two women at that time that did own their own production companies. But she moves into television really because she's upset with her roles and she's upset that she's not getting what she, she wants, um, which I find kind of ironic because she, she thinks that the roles are too bland, but then she moves into the Donna Reed show, which a lot of people say, you know, is kind of the ultimate mother show. But, mm -hmm. but of course you show, and we'll get into that in a little bit, uh, that she's actually much more complex and that's what she wanted. She wanted more complex roles. She didn't yeah. want to feel like she was just playing the same role over and over yeah. and over. And that's what the studio system did. Um, so she she's she bridges these two eras of Hollywood, you know, the early studio era where the studios had full control over their employees with the contracts, like you mentioned. Um, and that all started to fall apart in the late 1940s. The Supreme Court um, sort of outlawed a number of their practices and the, the kind of the free agents, the independent. Uh, contracts became much more popular. And then at the same time, television was invented and the studios at first uh, saw them as a threat. Yeah. Then realized they were an opportunity. But as you show, they were, TV was an opportunity for um, a number of actors too. So there was, for one thing in the 1950s, there was live plays put on TV and people like Charlton Heston and all these big name actors, that's where they got their start. And then they would move into movies. And then we see people moving out of movies into TV like Donna Reed, where she sees this great opportunity to kind of try to control her image. So let's talk more about the be, what being a producer means. Um, she did it with her husband, but you, you find that he just kind of handled the the finances yeah and she was doing more of the artistic side right yeah so from what I found about her I mean she she was really I mean she had control over the scripts apparently she would rewrite stuff into the scripts she would bring in script writers that she wanted she had some female script writers she brought in some blacklisted script writers um who who wrote under a pseudonym um, she, she had kind of control over where this, the story and where the show was going. Um, and you see that in the script. I mean, it, it's very female centric. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, I mean, Tony apparently was not on set very often. He kind of just controlled the financial side, like you said. Um, and she did kind of all the rest. And it's interesting too, because if you read these interviews with the, you know, people on set, kind of the lighting the lighting guys and and the other actors and actresses who were on set, they only talk about Donna and they only talk about Donna behind the scenes. There's really no mention of Tony, um, mm -hmm. which I think is, is fascinating, especially because, you know, we're talking about, you know, now we see women producers. I think, you know, I, I looked up the number yesterday because it had been, you know, it's been three years since we, I last looked at this. Um, mm -hmm. And there's about 27%, I think, of of women who are producers. That's not their, that's not 27% who own their own production company, but 27% of producers are women. Um, and so it's still not a large number. And so the fact that in the 50s, you've got a female who is controlling this, this narrative and her, her own storyline, I think is really impressive. And it says something about Donna, that she has this kind of this strength behind this character that and, and her, her own Hollywood persona mm -hmm. of being this kind of goody two shoes. Um, yeah, you have a great quote in there where someone calls her the, the iron fist <laughs> and the soft glove or something yeah, like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and apparently she was tough. Apparently on the on set, <laughs> you know, behind the scenes, she was really tough. And she fought for a lot of stuff that she wanted to be included in the show. Um, and if she didn't like something, it wasn't going to go. Um, you know, even Shelley Fabre, who plays the daughter on the show, she in the, I think, late 90s, early 2000s, she has a quote where she's talking about how Donna is a feminist and she's, you know, she doesn't understand why the show doesn't get more kind of recognition for pushing the boundaries in ways um, that, that it does. And it's all because of, of Donna and what she does behind the scenes as well as on, on television. Mm -hmm. Well, how did you even know who Donna, I mean, you didn't grow up in the 50s and 60s, so how did you know who she is? How did you have access to her show? How did you watch the episodes? Yeah, so I so I grew up watching some of these shows. So like Dick Van Dyke, I, Mary Tyler Moore is obviously later, but I did watch the Mary Tyler Moore show and Nick at Night. 
put them back in the day. Um, my parents, yeah, my parents watched the Donna Reed show when they were kids. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I'd heard of the shows like Leave it to Beaver and, and Father Knows Best and stuff like that. But, um, you know, this paper started as a paper for your seminar class. Yeah. Um, and I was trying to figure out, I knew I wanted to do something with the portrayal of women um, in the 1950s. And I was like, okay, like, you know, what do I want to do? And so I started looking at pop culture and television. And I actually, I mean, really found the show through Google, <laughs> um, you know, Googling family shows in the 1950s. And that's kind of how I, I had heard of it, but that's how I really started kind of watching a lot of these, these TV shows and then realizing there's really something here. Um, and to, so in accessing it, it is hard because, so seasons one through five are available. They are on DVD and they, when I, when I was watching the show, it's on Hulu, um, where now it's moved over to Amazon Prime and it's free. Um, but at the time I watched it obviously on DVDs, um, and seasons, it, it ran from 1958 to 1966. Uh, it's eight seasons and seasons six through eight are not available. Um, they originally ran on television. They ran, I think, on like at night for a little while, and then they ran on several other kind of channels in the early 2000s. <clears throat> um, but and they played all of the seasons, but they're not a, the last seasons are not available. Um, you can find some of them on YouTube. There's some like bootlegged versions of people who have taped them mm -hmm. off, off television, so you can see some of that. And then obviously, I've got a book that has a description of every single episode that. Has, that was that aired so <clears throat> I do know of, of kind of what's in all the shows but I actually haven't seen you know every episode of the, the last three seasons because they're not available yeah. um, but I originally again I'd, I'd heard of the show through my parents um, but then Google was my friend and nice. kind of helping me narrow down family television shows when I was trying to figure out what to write about and you watched over a hundred episodes. So yeah. you, you did watch a lot of them. Yeah. I mean, I've seen pretty much all of every episode in season one through five. Okay. Yeah. And you say that she, that the Donna Reed show was falsely lumped with other family sitcoms as conformist. So what were these other sitcoms? Yeah. And how conformist? So um, the other shows that I, I originally had looked at, um, you know, Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet is one. And I, I primarily narrowed it down to, and again, you can Google, you know, family television shows mm -hmm. in the 1950s. And I narrowed it down to Adventures of Ozzie, Ozzie and Harriet, um, which aired from 1952 to 1966. Um, I looked at Father Knows Best, um, which I think was um, 1954 to 1960, I wanna say. Um, Leave it to Beaver, which was 1957 to 63. <clears throat> and then the Dick Van Dyke show. Um, which was 61 through 66. And I wanted to find shows that overlapped and that portrayed a family on television. Um, and, you know, if you look at these shows, they're all about the dad. The dad is the center of the family and the father is the center of the storyline. And, and then, you know, like um, father knows best. It's that every single episode, the dad is coming in and he's solving this problem. The dad is coming in and he's kind of, you know, dad explaining you know, what's going on and, and how to fix it to his children and, and leave it to Beaver is the same way. Every interaction is with the father. Um, and then once you start watching Donna Reed, she's, she's the mother. I mean, she, she is the center of the entire story. Everything, all the storylines really revolve around Donna and it's completely different. And I think, you know, what's interesting about it, because you can also say, you know, looking at television in that time period, there's also I Love Lucy, which obviously is a, a female centric show. Um, she is the driver of that storyline, but she's, it's very slapstick and there's always kind of these, these silly storylines where Lucy, every episode, Lucy does something where she gets in trouble and she does something to hide whatever she did from Desi and then Desi finds out and then she apologizes and then he forgives her and that's the end of the episode. Every, almost every episode is like that. Um, whereas the Donna Reed show is, is not, there's not that type of humor in that. It's not a slapstick style show. It is more in line with these other kind of male dominated family shows. Um, and you have to keep in mind, you know, in the 1950s, they have really rigid gender, gender roles and it's, they have more rigid gender roles than any other decade before or since. And so it is amazing. I mean, you know, this, this post-war, post, you know, World War II kind of ideology and going into the Cold War is this 
kind of these deep anxieties around masculinity and not wanting women to be too in control. And so it is amazing that you've got this show that is with these other conformist shows that are showing, you know, the family and, um, you know, they have kind of these similar plot lines, but instead of everything revolving around the father, you've got something that people have been afraid of, this strong female character and it's the mother. I mean, she's really the center of everything. And even when the father, um, his, you know, the, the husband's name is, is Alex, he's played by Carl Betts. Even when the father is disciplining the children, it's because Don has told him to. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, and that's not, you're not seeing that in other shows. And so it's, it's kind of incredible. And again, you know, if you, if you watch these shows today, you'd say, oh, it's kind of bland. You know, all of them are. They're kind of these bland plot lines where it's kind of, you know, fun and um, and people have complained about this kind of simpler time, but it's like, you know, they're doing that on purpose. Because if you think about the 1950s, there are all these concerns and, and worries about, you know, you've got the Cold War, you're worried about, you know, the nuclear, the nuclear bomb, you're worried about the Soviet Union. And so they're putting this stuff on television to reassure people that it's okay, that, you know, we can escape into TV just like we do today. Um, and so, you know, it is, it's incredible that you've got this, the show that's up against all these other family shows. And she's the only one who is, who is a mother and she's, you know, leading the story. Mm -hmm. kind of leading, leading yeah, the you, even, you even say how they entertained the idea of calling the show Mother Knows Better. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, like contrasted against Father Knows Best. And I yeah. guess they, they probably just, because she was a big name, they probably decided to go with the Donnery show, but <laughs> it's still, that's the tone of it is that mother does know better. <laughs> yeah, and she she does. I mean, it's like in one of the episodes, she teaches her son how to box. Yeah. It's not, yeah, it's not the father doing it. It's Donna doing it. And she knows how to box. It's not like she had to learn to then teach the son. She said, here, let me show you how to do this. And she knows how to, how to box, which is not something that shown on television in those other shows. Mm -hmm. um, and so she's, she's stepping outside of her own gender role and stepping into the father's shoes. And you have to keep in mind too, I mean, even though these other shows are very father-centric, the father worked all day. And so in reality, the mother is the center of the family. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I just, I, looking at it again, you have to, you know, I, I watch the different shows kind of in a row. And if you watch them in a row, you can really see, you know, mm -hmm. Donna's pushing these boundaries that no one else is doing on television at that time. Mm -hmm. It's really cool. But in some ways, uh, the show is the same because it's family oriented. It's two parents who are married. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, a heterosexual marriage. It's a, all of these stories seem to be in sort of white middle-class suburbia. Yeah. So it is kind of conformist, I guess, from that point, but um, you also mentioned how she does bring um, some racial elements into, into the show. And it's not a lot, but it's more than any of these other shows we're doing. So yeah. there's something yeah. to be that too. Can you talk yeah. about that Yeah, bit? Willie Mays is on the show for several episodes. Um, apparently she wanted to bring on, she wanted to have an African-American child in the show and they were told no. Like um, is it her? Her? Is that Say that again as a neighbor, was that right? Yeah, yes, yeah. So they wanted they wanted this child to come in as a neighbor and be kind of a, a it wasn't just gonna, you know, a lot of times there, there were black actors and some of these on television, but they usually would have cameos and that was kind of it. Mm -hmm. um, but they wanted to bring on this child to have a role on the show, ask the neighbor. Um, and they were told no, they were told that it, the sponsors could pull out and that the show would have been blacked out in the South. And so they said, no, you can't do that. Um, but there are other conversations too that she has and she's, you know, there's a, an episode Geisha Girl where um, one of the husband's friends has married a Japanese woman and she, she's they're moved back to Hillsdale. Um, and, you know, she talks to this woman and they're kind of talking about this culture and she, you know, the, the two of them are, and they're aghast because they feel like this Japanese woman is too subservient to her husband, which is 
a little ironic, but, um, you know, and, and so they sit down with her and they say, you don't have to do everything he wants you to do. You don't have to give him tea. You don't have to, you know, do all that stuff. And so they, they take, at the end of the, the episode, they take her and they kind of Americanize her and they go shopping and she comes home and tells her husband, no. And the husband's just aghast that, you know, she said, no. Um, but yeah, I mean, she, she's pushing, she's subtly pushing these kind of racial barriers that again, you're not seeing on other shows. And, and, it, and it is, like you said, it, it is a lot like these other television shows, but there are subtle things that, that do make it stand out in ways that the others, you know, aren't, they're not doing those things. Yeah. And especially with, with the complexity of, of her character. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about one thing about your thesis is that you um, try to, you position it sort of amidst the, the burgeoning feminist movement and especially with the publication of Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique. So the show is from, was on from 1958 to 1966. The Feminine Mystique was released in 1963. So smack in the middle. Um, so you say that in some ways the Donna Reed show foreshadowed the feminine mystique, but that Donna, the character Donna, also diverged from Betty Friedan in, in key ways. So let's break that down in terms of what that means. How did she foreshadow uh, the feminine mystique? What was she doing before 1963? Yeah, so I think, you know, um, with the feminine mystique, and it's actually right behind me. Uh, <laughs> so with the feminine mystique, you know, like you said, it was published in 1963 and, and Betty is kind of, for Dan's arguing that, you know, it's the problem with no name. And that kind of is, you know, this kind of word for the unhappiness of women in the fifties and sixties. And, and that it's a silent stirring that there's something going on here and that women aren't fulfilled in the home and that they've been placed in this domestic fear because, sphere because culture has put them there. Um, and that their identity totally wraps around their husband. Whereas Donna does foreshadow some of that. So Donna is obviously, you know, kind of, um, she, she's talking about, you know, in within the show she's there are kind of mentions of women not being fulfilled and and kind of this unsettling um of women being kind of grouped together and not having an identity um and she pushes back against a lot of that you know in one of the episodes just a housewife i think it's in season two and which aired in 1960 um she's she's mad because there is a radio show and and they ask these women at the grocery store what they do and he says oh you're just a housewife and Donna's really angry about it. And she says, and she goes on this radio show and she says, we're not just housewives. You know, women are diplomats, we're nurses, we're psychologists. We do more than just sit at home. And, and so she, you see this kind of pushing back against kind of these stereotypes of women, you know, just being in the home and, and not having these kind of identities. Um, but then she, so then she does kind of diverge from that because I think, you know, really, Donna is fulfilled being a mother and a wife. And the show isn't about her not wanting to be those things or fill those roles. It's about her finding her identity and being kind of herself in addition to being a wife and a mother and finding fulfillment through that. But then also kind of, you know, being separate from that and being Donna, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and she, at, by the end of the show, she's writing a novel in the attic. Um, you know, and the family's kind of teasing her about it, that she's an author and writing the big, great novel. Um, but she does. I mean, she pursues these things while also, you know, finding fulfillment through her role, which is totally different than what Betty Friedan is arguing. Um, and, and Betty Friedan does get some criticism for that, that she leaves out kind of, there, there's no leeway. And we also know, too, I mean, looking in hindsight, we know that, you know, Betty Friedan is going to become pretty radical. Um, but the book itself, Own a Mystique, I mean, it's, it's not super radical in what she's saying. She's just talking about, you know, that there's, there's something going on here and women are not feeling fulfilled and they're bored at home. And again, you see that kind of in the show of Donna kind of pushing against those things, but, and, you know, and the biggest way that she's differing from it is that she's not, Donna's not saying you can't be a mother and a wife because she clearly finds a lot of joy in doing that, but you can be more than that and that's okay. Yeah, I mean, I, you show, first of all, that um, part of her finding fulfillment as a mother and a wife is because she has a lot of moral authority in the yeah. home. And she asserts that moral authority. Um, 
and she tries to assert herself more as a partner in the marriage. Um, so can you talk about some examples where she, where she does those things? Yeah, um, you know, in a, in a lot of this, like there's one episode where the son is, he gets bad grades in school, he's a bad report card, and he gets C's. And, you know, Donna is really upset about it. And the husband isn't. And he just says, he's average, it's fine. Um, and, you know, Donna talk, goes and talks to the son and says, you know, this isn't okay. You need to try harder. And Donna's the one having that conversation. And then she goes and talks to the husband um, and says, we can't, this isn't acceptable. And so eventually kind of Alex comes around to what Donna is saying, but Donna is the one driving all of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's another episode where she goes to book club and they're talking about television um, and they're talking about how television is, is bad for the home. Um, and so she goes home and she decides they're going to have all of these deep intellectual conversations and they're going to read and they're going to do all this stuff. And they do, they talk about politics on the show. They talk about current events. Um, and she's also in the episode, you know, where, where Jeff has done poorly on his report card. Um, she, she does, you know, she's like, we need to kind of beef up what we're talking about at the dinner table because clearly my son is not learning enough. Um, and that's all being driven by her. Um, you know, and, and then in her marriage, um, she's really the one who kind of drives any sort of issue that's going on in the show, any sort of conflict is being resolved by Donna. Um, it's not being driven by the husband. It's all being, you know, Donna saying, okay, we need to do X, Y, Z. There was one episode um, where they go to a play and at intermission, you know, they're with their friends and they're talking about this play and the husband quotes Donna's interpretation of the play back to the friends and everyone's like oh my gosh that's so smart I hadn't thought of that and you know and Donna's like well, wait a minute this is my you know because and the husband apparently had turned to her and said I don't really understand what's going on and then he quotes her interpretation to everybody else and says oh this is what I think um and so you you do see that I mean she's she's got this kind of personality that kind of helps her have control that's in a balance I think with her femininity and in the show um mm -hmm. and again it, it's subtle um you know it's not this kind of she's not this domineering character but she's doing this in these subtle ways um throughout the show yeah and i mean another thing i appreciated about your thesis is that it shows that they're always kind of negotiating their marriage you know and in their roles within that marriage so they're not just it's not just shown as this like static perfect marriage like there's a lot of push back and forth about him going away for the weekend and not yeah. asking her first and <laughs> yeah. you know, to bribe her with gifts and yeah, yeah there's like, arguing and conflict yeah and and she's relieved they're arguing there's one episode where you know they talk about how they don't want to be the perfect couple because everyone apparently at you know, his, he's a doctor and, you know, at work, they're all talking about how they're the perfect couple. And she's mad about it. She's like, I don't want to be the perfect couple. And at the end of the episode, they're arguing and she's like, oh, thank, you know, thank God we're, we're arguing. This is wonderful. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, there, there is a lot of, like you said, this negotiating between the two of them that you don't see on these other shows. There's not even negotiating in the Lucy show. Um, mm -hmm. or the, I, I love Lucy. I mean, there, there's none of that. Um, it's a lot of the two of them kind of working to figure things out um and there are times she's mad at Alex there are times that Alex is mad at her there are times where she's comforting him um because he gets mad that everyone thinks she's like the perfect wife and that she, <laughs> she's the perfect one in the relationship and he's kind of jealous and upset about it and so she has to she goes and takes some shopping to try to kind of resolve the <laughs> yeah and, and so you see kind of the two of them you know it seems more like a real marriage especially for that time period of this kind of push and pull um mm -hmm. And, and again, you have to keep in mind, I mean, these shows had enormous reach. You know, we, we think about how many shows are on television today and how many people own televisions. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't really the case at the time. I mean, a lot of people had TVs, but it's not as many as they do now. And the population is different. You know, there, in 1963, I think there was like 190 million people, whereas today they're over 300 million. And 24 million people tuned in to watch the Donna Reed show. I mean, that, that's more than the numbers for Sunday Night Football mm -hmm. um, by a large number. And so you just have to think about just how big of a reach these shows had and how, you know, watching this on television would have really made an impact on, I think, a lot of people. Um, yeah, that's true. And there's just a few networks, you know, three or four. Yeah. 
major networks and then there might be some local affiliates. So on one hand, they didn't have as much competition, but on the other hand, they would get a greater share of the people who were tuning in. So you're right, ton, millions and millions of people <laughs> watch the show. And you also bring out um, her sort of, her mentoring of the children. And you already mentioned the son and the boxing, which is a great, great example, um, but also the daughter and how she is always pushing the daughter to um, develop her own personality and individual individuality um, before before getting married. Yeah, yeah. There is a whole plot line. Um, Mary, her one of her friends gets married. I think like eighteen, and they go to the wedding. And you know, Mary's talking about how she wants to get married, and oh, that's such a dream. And um, Donna and Alex are mad about it. They show this conversation where, you know, Donna's like, I don't want her to do that. I don't want her to get married yet. That's way too young. It's way too early for her to even, she's, she's a child. She needs to be doing other things and she pushes her to go to college. Um, and that's, again, you know, you know, now we'd be like, well, that's on TV everywhere. Um, <laughs> but at the time, I mean, you're not seeing those types of things of, you know, encouraging a female to go to college that's a really big deal. Um, and, you know, talking about these kind of, they're pushing back against these conservative trends, like getting married really young. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think it's interesting. So at the beginning of the series, they talk about how Donna got married young. And then by the end of the series, they talk about how she was a nurse before she got married. Mm -hmm. So they kind of like push, they kind of change their storyline a little bit, um, which I think is, is interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, she does. She encourages her daughter to kind of be her own self. And in this too, the daughter celebrates a lot of kind of Donna's achievements. Their daughter is, is really excited because Donna decides to run for town council. Um, mm -hmm. And she's like, you're an inspiration for all the girls at school. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, you see this kind of, you know, this empowering of her daughter through kind of, you know, Donna kind of pushing back against some of these kind of conservative trends and norms for the time, mm -hmm. which is pretty neat, especially can considering it's before the second wave of feminism even started. I mean, this is going on before all of that. So um, it's, it, I think it's really cool. Yeah, like through the, she thinks about opening her own business. She yeah. thinks about running for town council. She writes for the local paper several times and uh, she does a ton of volunteer work too that sometimes throws the household into to tumult. <laughs> and so we see again why Donna is important because when she's not home, they the don't know what to do without her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There are multiple episodes where she's not there and they're all like, what are we going to have for dinner? What do we do? Um, you know, Donna comes home and of course is like, oh, she fixes everything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they, there are lots of episodes where they just don't know what to do without Donna being there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think it's really important that they have this backstory where she she's gone to college or nursing school at least, and she had a life before she got married. Yeah. And that pushes the overall point that she's trying to make to the daughter, and I think probably to the rest of the audience, that you can be an equal in your marriage, but you have to know who you are first, and you have to like develop your, your education and your skills and your personality before that's gonna be really a successful kind of goal. Yeah, and that you can, in your marriage, you can still pursue other things because mm -hmm. that's what she does. And that, I think that strengthens her marriage. Mm -hmm. um, and you kind of see that in the show, which again is fascinating, especially for this time period that she's, you know, she, she changes throughout the show and she has more, um, you know, goals and, and things that she wants to do. And Alex encourages her to do those things, which again, you know, you're not really seeing that anywhere else. Oh no, yeah, Desi was not, or Ricky was not encouraging Lucy. No, <laughs> he was not. Was crazy, but <laughs> no. he's like, oh, Lucy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and everything Donna does. I mean, Alex says, if that's what you want to do, that's, do yeah, it. go for it. Um, yeah, cool. go for it. Yeah, well, you, I mean, so, in some ways she connects with Free Dan, in other ways she does not. And so you connected um, Donna Stone, the character is representing uh, a strain of feminism that the scholar Christina Hoff Summers has labeled maternal feminism. Um, so 
I mean, I think we've kind of gone over how she represents that already, but if you could just briefly tell us what maternal feminism is and what you think the significance of this is at the time. Yeah, I mean, I think so. Maternal feminism is a little bit different than conservative feminism. So it's this kind of idea that um, women can seek to kind of, um, you know, it, women are empowered to challenge gender norms while still kind of seeking to fulfill themselves in whatever role that they want, whether that's as a mother, whether it's a housewife, whether it's through a career. So it's kind of this, this pushing back on gender norms and pushing for equality without kind of changing societal norms or society, if that kind of makes sense. So it's more kind of this, this fulfillment of motherhood while also pushing for equality, which you see through, through Donna Reed. And, and, and keep in mind too that this, I, I think this is where it gets kind of tricky because you know maternal feminism and, and Summer says this isn't political. So this is more of kind of this worldview of feminism, of women being empowered to challenge gender roles and challenge gender norms while also kind of doing, being and fulfilling themselves in whatever way that is. You can be a mother and still be a feminist, that it's okay, that's mm -hmm. still feminism. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and I, I think too, we get really bogged down in this, especially now, and especially knowing, you know, now was formed in 1966 kind of as the show is ending and that we know that's going to become radical we know it's going to become very political even the me too movement is very political um and so you kind of have to take the political side out of of what maternal feminism is and it's really this kind of this construct that you know feminism can exist without and you can you can be a mother you can be a housewife and be fulfilled through that but still push back on gender norms and still try to change and push for equality without wanting to kind of over overturn and overthrow society. Um, mm -hmm. And, and you, you see that through Donna. And, and one thing I was thinking about when I was kind of looking back through my paper, you know, you, you see some of this through, there's an episode of the Poodle Parlor where Donna and her friend, they decide they want to open up a poodle parlor. And her husband says, no, both husbands are like, that's a joke. You're not going to do that. And it's kind of this lighthearted storyline of like, oh, it's so silly. They want to open up a poodle parlor um, and they go to the bank and because they need a loan to open up this business. And the banker says, no, women can't get loans and without a, a man's signature and you can't do this. And he tells them well, all the reasons why they're going to fail at, at, at opening up a business. And they go home and you see it's heartbreaking. I mean, because you see this as Donna is realizing that you know, you see this play out on TV of like, these are real things. That's a real law. At the time, women could not get a loan without a man's signature. They couldn't have a bank account without a man's co-signature. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's kind of this heartbreaking instance where she's pushing against it and she's realizing that she is held back by, by the law because she's a woman. And eventually they realize, they, they tell their husbands, we've realized they're not enough poodles in Hillsdale, that this is not, you know, this is, we're not gonna make any money because there are only two poodles registered in, Hills, in Hillsdale. Um, so we're gonna put this on the back burner, but, you know, I think, you know, in that she realizes and that, that the law is unfair. And while she, again, she's fulfilled by being a mother, but she also realizes that the sexes aren't equal. And that's kind of, I think, really what Summers is talking about, that you can you can push to change that and fight for more equality with the genders without wanting again to kind of change and totally kind of overturn society. Um, and I think it's something too, we're still talking about, we're still having these conversations today and you've seen it play out with the pandemic of, you know, of women asking, you know, can I be a mother? Can I have a career? How to be, there are all these books that are out on how to be both, how to, you know, I think Lean In was the book about how you can do all these things. Um, you know, we're talking about women CEOs and the glass ceiling, and we're still having these conversations that are really important. And, you know, I just think it's interesting that, you know, Donna, this is, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago, where she's, she's having these kind of moments where she's realizing that, you know, things aren't equal between the sexes. And, you know, here's how she can, she's pushing back against this subtly and we're still talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, I mean, she's not 
trying to liberate herself from motherhood or from being a wife, but she is trying to sort of expand what those categories mean and the opportunities within them, it seems like. So, but you're right. I mean, we're still having this conversation. I just saw a couple of weeks ago, this tweet from a journalist, uh, Jill Filipovic. She works for, I think she writes for the New York Times and she's a lawyer and she's got, um, I'm gonna see if I can find it. And her beat is sort of women and um, in the law, but then she tweeted, what, you know, I, here's an issue of example setting. What sort of issue are you setting for a kid uh, when dad works for pay and mom does the care work at home? Lots of reasons not to want to set that example for a child. And I was floored to see that in 2021, someone would be chastising a woman for choosing to stay at home. Yeah. And I think that that's what we're seeing with Donna Reed. It's like, she's, she sees both sides of the issue, but she's never gonna condemn someone for choosing, you know, to prioritize family life. Yeah, and I, I think that's, you know, again, that's kind of what, like you said, that's kind of what, you know, Donna is, is talking about. You can, you can find fulfillment in whatever it is you wanna do. And I think it's interesting Donna Reed, the actress, you know, separate, obviously, from Donna Stode, she has this whole interview that she does in the 60s where she's talking about how single women maybe are more fulfilled than married women. And this was at the time when apparently Tony Owen was a notorious serial cheater. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, some of her comments and her interviews, I think, are kind of about her own family life. But um, yeah, I mean, she she she's kind of pushing these boundaries by also saying women can be whatever they want to be and that's okay. And, and like you said, I, you know, it is, why are we still having these conversations of women not being able to do what they want to do? Yeah. And there's an episode you mentioned um, where like one of her college friends or a childhood friend or something comes back and yeah. they both have taken different life paths. One's a career woman, one's a family woman. And, um, and they totally respect each other's choices. It's just yeah. like a nice exchange about what have you, what, what's your experience been like and yeah. what would you change? What would you not change? That sort of thing. So yeah, that kind of respecting of the choices is something I think is throughout the series, which was yeah. something we can appreciate. Well, um, let's fast forward to today. Uh, <laughs> well, actually, before we do, there's a question in the chat we should get to from Kevin Kale. Hi, Kevin. It's great to see you in the chat anyway. And Kevin was in the research seminar where this all started. <laughs> Going full circle here. So he asks, do you think that the Donna Reed show with a female lead was inspirational for other female lead shows like Marlo Thomas and That Girl, Diane Carroll and Julia? Mary Tyler Moore and her show. Um, and then we'll get more to the current day, but what do you think that she kind of paved the way for those shows in the sixties? I think so. I mean, you know, I, I don't see how she didn't. Um, you know, I think you see this widely received show. I mean, she won an Emmy, she won, it was nominated for Golden Globe. She won a Golden Globe, I believe. Um, you know, it was nominated for all this stuff and it, it was a, a, one of the top shows. And, you know, I, I think seeing all these women on TV, so you've got I Love Lucy, then you've got the Donna Reed show, then you've got Julia Child, these kind of female oriented, female kind of this narrative of, of women leading the show. Um, I, I, she has to be an influence on that. Um, whether, you know, they were watching the show and saying, I can do that, you know, I don't know. But, but being seeing women kind of break again break down these barriers of, of they're doing this and then I can too it makes it kind of more of a norm um so I think she definitely influenced the rest and that she was six I mean it is really hard to have a successful tv show yeah. think about all the failed pilots and yeah shows that don't make it out of even one season and she was on for how many eight eight seasons? years yeah. yeah and the only reason why the show ended was because she was tired yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it wasn't like, it, yeah, it didn't lose popularity. It's not like they had, you know, kind of just changed things. The, the show ended because she just wanted to move on to something else. 
Um, and so I think within that too, I mean, this, this is a, a long running television show that was really, and it kept gaining more viewers as it went on. Apparently mm -hmm. after the first season, they had thought about canceling it, but the sponsor loved it. The sponsor and his wife loved it. It was sponsored by Campbell Soup. Um, and I think Johnson & Johnson was the backup, but they loved it. And so they were like, we're not canceling the show. We want it to be on the air. And then the next season, it be, kind of became this, this hit. Mm -hmm. um, so and it is, I mean, she's tired because it's such... Yeah. hard work yeah. <laughs> to it's do little, yeah week I mean week after week yeah, of filming and she's also a mother I mean she's a working mother at the time she's has children and she's married I mean so you have to think like she she's doing all this stuff but she's also mothering young kids um so yeah she got tired and decided she was done she had four children is that correct yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah um and then Kevin also asked like so there, she's a forerunner to these shows in the 60s. And then what? how do you think it compares to later family sitcoms like Married with Children or Modern Family or um, some of the shows that are on today? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, I think it paves the way for a female oriented show. So, you know, for the show to revolve around the mother. Um, Roseanne, when Roseanne, the Roseanne show came on, um, they apparently said it was like a combination of Donna Reed, um, I think maybe Lucy and somebody else. And so, you know, Roseanne was supposed to be, and, and again, they're completely different, very different women, very different storylines, but, you know, it's a show where the mother is the character. I mean, she, she is the center of the family. She's the control. She is the one who is kind of the star of the show and then everyone else is kind of circling around her. And I think I, in Donna Reed at the time, that was the only show that was doing that. Um, and then you see these shows come after that these are popular and people will watch this. Um, mm -hmm. So I definitely think there, there's a large influence there and they've been compared. I mean, people do when there were, you know, again, like Roseanne, when they were trying to advertise the show, they said, she's a mix of Donna Reed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which is you know I don't know if I would draw that comparison but at the time that's what they said yeah it's kind of funny <laughs> yeah. um, I feel like there's a show on right now called American Housewife that I watch yeah. pretty regularly and I feel like the the star of that Katie Mixon I, her character I feel like is a lot like Donna Reed I mean she's a little her comedy is completely different but um, she's a stay-at-home mom. She has a few business ventures here and there, and she loves being a mom, but she also complains about being a mom, and there's negotiating between her and her husband, and I definitely see strains of Donna Reed. Yeah. Well, show. it's like the, the mother being a strong character and having a yeah. personality outside of being a mother, and that you can be all of these things. It doesn't have to be your full identity, but it's still a part of your identity, I think, is really kind of what they're talking about, and yeah. that that's okay. You can still be a feminist and you know, push for those things while also enjoying a traditional gender role and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, for those who have actually not seen the Donna Reed show, if there are any of those out here, um, do you have a favorite episode or like a favorite season? What would you recommend they, they go for to introduce yeah. themselves to Donna? I, so I'm trying to think. I really like Just a Housewife. That's probably my favorite episode. It's season two. Um, and it, that's the one where she's really mad about being kind of boxed into this corner of just a housewife. And um, I think that, that episode really kind of shows how she is pushing back and trying to say, you know, we're, we're all these things. I think later in the series, she does, it becomes a little bit sillier. So the storylines do become a little bit more slapstick. You know, she's trying to write an article for a, the paper and, She's like crawling around this hotel, trying to break into a room. So it gets kind of like this like silly, like comedy-esque kind of storyline. But I like, personally, I like the beginning seasons a little bit better because that's, again, I mean, this is 1950s, 1960, where she's pushing back on a lot of this stuff that's not being talked about. Um, and so I think that's kind of where you really see this stuff kind of coming out. So Just a Housewife season two is really good. Um, there's another one, it's actually season five where she's mad, a, a salesman comes to her door um, and he says, you know, I'm, we're trying to find what typical housewives do. I know what you're gonna serve for dinner. I know where, how often you vacuum. I know all these, and he's like rattling off all these statistics and Donna is livid about <laughs> it. And she's like, you know, how dare you sum me up into this statistic? And she's just going off about it. 
Um, and the whole episode is about her, you know, trying to push back against these statistics and she serves something completely different for dinner and she serves fruit for dessert and everyone's just up in arms because she's like totally changed her routine. Um, so that's a, that's a good one too. How dare you? I know how, I mean, she's, she is just so just up in arms about being called a typical housewife and you know, you don't know me, you don't know my routine. Um, so that's another good one. Yeah, and the funny thing about that is that she's not only mad at, at him, um, but she's also mad that the women are saying those things too. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm yeah. just a housewife. And she's like, yeah. you know, take some pride. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's what is interesting too, because it's, you know, she's not, yeah, she's not just mad at the man. She's also mad at some of these women who are putting themselves down and she finds it condescending. Mm-hmm. You know, a housewife isn't really a term where all these other things are people. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, we're individuals, and 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 you know, in some of these episodes too, there are a lot of women who kind of rally around her, um, and her daughter is like we talked about earlier, is just so supportive of all of this stuff. But but yeah, no, I mean, I mean, she's you know pushing back against other women and how women are kind of degrading themselves by just saying, oh, just a housewife. I don't yeah. care. That. Yeah, she's like it's it's it encompasses so many things. So yeah. your point of she's trying to kind of elevate that role and make people understand like what goes into it and it's all kinds of like you say psychology and all these other things right well and i was thinking too you know with with the pandemic i was thinking about donna and there's a a bunch of women were mad i think they were trying to i think it's called the marshall plan for moms i don't know if anyone has heard of this but um a bunch of housewives a bunch of people signed this thing asking for a, a stimulus check to be sent to housewives to be kind of reimbursed for their unseen labor and unseen work. Mm. And there a lot of mothers have been upset, a lot of stay-at-home moms have been upset because you know everyone's working from home and they're complaining about, oh, it's it's a lot of work. We're taking care of the kids, we're doing this and that. And you know, a lot of these stay-at-home moms are like, well, yeah, no duh. Like, yeah, it is hard work. It is a lot hard. More. Yeah, we're yeah. doing stuff. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. It's not just, you know, we're not watching TV all day. Yeah. And it's rewarding in a completely different way. Yeah. Not yeah. rewarding by a paycheck is rewarding in your relationships and and so forth well yeah. one person asked and i remember you mentioned this too uh asked about her, her her wardrobe and her costuming um like what she wore in the series and it changed over time right it does so she at the beginning is wearing dresses and heels and even at night they show her in a nightgown and she's in this like peignoir with little like heeled slippers. And you're like, that's not what people wear but, <laughs> at the time. But you know, you're like, that's not comfortable. Um, and then throughout the show, she is in pants. Um, she does start changing into pants. Her hair gets shorter. Um, at one point she dyes her hair blonde for fun, um, which she was a blonde, but she goes even more blonde. Um, so she does, her, her clothes do change over time and they, they kind of change with the trends. Um, there's one episode where Donna is out of town, I think with Jeff, and it's just Mary and Alex at home and the house is trashed all weekend because Donna's not there. And um, Mary was wearing pants and Alex tells her she has to change before Donna gets home, um, which I think he's like, you're too casual. You have to put on you know an actual outfit, which is interesting because she's, in, I mean, to our, especially to our standards today, she is in. A, a very nice outfit. It's kind of yeah. a formal at home wear. Um, but yeah, no, Donna's, Donna's clothes do change and so, so do Mary's throughout the show. It was uh, the days before spandex. Spandex yes. changed a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, here's another question that's really good from Caroline Bowers. Um, so th- that sort of concept, just a housewife, um, how has that concept changed from that time period to our time period? Do you feel like it has or, or not? Yeah. Um, I guess. Yeah. And I, I think they do talk about this some in the show. So, uh, Donna talks about having been to school. So Donna does talk about having an education. Um, obviously she encourages her daughter to have an education, um, at the time there, I think was Adelaide Stevenson, who does this whole speech about women and how he, I think he goes to one of the Seven Sisters schools and he does his whole speech. Yeah, and um, that's, just to clarify, Adelaide Stevenson, this is when he was the representative to the United Nations, is that? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he does this whole speech about, you know, these are, these are women who are getting an education, they're in college, and he does the whole, this whole thing about how women, college-educated women need to be mothers and they need to go home and find fulfillment 
being a wife. And it's like this whole speech about that to these women who are clearly educated and motivated. And um, so, you know, I, I think there's a lot of talk about women, especially at this time in, in the 50s and early 60s of women not going to college and just being a housewife and that's degrading and condescending. And I think Donna pushes really hard against that and that you can be well-educated and, and and again, pushing against this label of just a housewife of she is well-educated and her daughter is well-educated and she tells her daughter to go to school um, because that's the best way to fulfill yourself before you get married. Um, and so I, I think that's kind of a lot of what Donna is also pushing back against with this title of just a housewife. It, 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 it's condescending and it's mm -hmm. condescending to, you know, again, and, and women today, again, we're having these conversations of women can have as many degrees and be extraordinarily smart and still it's okay for them to want to be a mom or want to be a stay-at-home mother or be a wife. It's okay for them to do whatever they want to do within that. And I think Donna's really speaking to that mm -hmm. um, and how just that term shouldn't be that label. Yeah. As just as like, yeah. it's not, not worth as much, which, you know, every family is different and jobs are different. Some jobs are more flexible than others. And yeah. I also think it depends on how many children you have, you know, like yeah. <laughs> I have a pretty flexible job and I have one child. Yeah. Um, I think I might take a different approach if I had more children and a non-flexible job. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's part of it too. But I mean, I think Caroline's question is, is onto something, you know, that there is still kind of that just a, um, that we see thrown around, but I think there's a lot of people who push back against it too. Even. And rightly so. I mean, yeah. you know, I think again, we're, we're still having, and what's fascinating to me is that we are still having these conversations. We are still not a whole lot. I mean, things, a lot has changed, but not a whole lot has changed in mm -hmm. terms of gender roles and how we view women. Um, and we're seeing all of this really play out right now, especially in the news. Um, and people are at home. So I think it's kind of changing how we view what different roles are within the home. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Donna's talking about, you know, this is a problem. And I just, I, again, the whole thing, I, when I started watching it, I did not expect to find what I did. And I just thought my mind was like blown. Just <laughs> watching it, and you're like, you know, she's talking about these really important issues and these really cool things in the 1950s, which isn't being done at all. Mm -hmm. It's really cool. Well, I think that's a great way to end it. Your mind being blown by Donna Reed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope if you guys go and watch it this afternoon or whenever this weekend, I hope everyone's minds are blown by just <laughs> Donna being Donna on the show and push, really subtly pushing back against these gender norms. It's really fascinating. So, all right. Well, thanks everyone for attending. Thanks, Caitlin and Annie for joining me. And yeah, we really appreciate you you being here and have a great afternoon. Thank you to everyone for attending. And, and Dr. Raymond, I, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. This paper would not have been what it is without your help and without your advising me and your guidance. And so really thank you because it, it would not be as popular or we would not be here without you. So thank you so much. Uh, well, you're welcome. Thank you. Very honored to, to have been asked to do this. So. All right. All right. Bye, everyone.